for the 38th in a series of shows focused on Brookline as an age-friendly community. In 2012, the World Health Organization designated Brookline its first age-friendly community in New England. This was the result of work by Brookline residents, the select board, town departments, and leadership provided by Brookline CAN, an all-volunteer organization that works with Brookline residents on issues with Brookline residents of all ages. Today, we're gonna to explore a key town department in this era of moving into a new health consciousness. Our guest is Sagal Reese, Director of the Public Health and Human Services Department. Sagal Reese is the Commissioner of the Public Health of Public Health and the Director of the Department. She's in that position since February of this year. Prior to that, she was the Public Health Director of the Town of Norwood for 15 years, and she spent 20 years working in all local departments and local, uh, local governments. She started as a health inspector for the city of Taunton. She's also now uh, called the immediate past president of the Massachusetts Health Offices Association. Actually, she was the president, the prior president for the last two years. And she's a member of the association's board of directors and has been for 15 years. Sagal Reese has a master's in public health for, uh, from Boston University, a local community hospital uh, college, and certificate in membership in management and leadership for uh, the from Suffolk University. Sagal, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. I'm uh, I'm excited to be here. Well, I only forgot one or two things, but <laughs> no, we're good. We're good. Um, it's really good to have you. It's, uh, it's good to have you at a time of uh, where I know we're not out of everything and we're not, but at least things are changing and we're heading into a new time. New diseases, new problems, et cetera, but, but at least there's change. Uh, so first of all, what's your role? I mean, uh, tell me a, a bit more about what the uh, public health commissioner is. Sure, sure. So, um... The, the role of public health in, um, in my role as the commissioner in the, the department is really to be um, sort of the chief health strategist. Um, so many things in our environment affect our health and we call them the social determinants of health. And um, it's really um, sort of the definition of that is the, the conditions in our environment where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes. What does all that mean? Um, so things like safe and sanitary housing, your housing where you live affect your health, access to education, access to safe uh, foods and healthy foods, um, walkable communities, the, the built environment you live in, all these things um, affect your health and actually have the biggest impact on your health more than genetics or the actual health care that you get. So public health looks to address those social determinants of health to create health of your communities. And, and what's the difference between public health uh, for Brookline and the state and your relationship? I'm not yeah. quite, I, you're both environment, you care about the environment, obviously, you care about the people, but how does it work? Um, public health and prevention in particular is mostly delivered um, on the municipal level. Right. Um, so the, the State Department of Public Health and the feds, we sort of have that three-tiered level, um, all have different roles in the public health system, but the actual, um, uh, Im implication and boots on the ground is, is your local health department and that, you know, policy and regulations might be state set at the state and federal level, um, but the people actually doing the work are all on the local level. Examples of that, like for our, um, the food codes and when we do our inspections in restaurants, that's actually the federal food code that we enforce adopted by the state and then executed by the locals. Um, but then examples of local regulations might be um, you know, we, uh, we're working right now on our solid waste regulations or uh, body art regulations that we also enforce in the community. Those would be local regulations. Good. And then, you know, there is, the, in addition to all that, we have state regulations that we enforce also. So we get the full variety, but we are in, in, the, in Massachusetts, it's every city and town has their own health department and we have the authority and the responsibility to implement all those requirements. So when you go to uh, hair song and there's regulations for them because of COVID or something else. Uh, who does the, who put in those regulations and who inspects them? Um, 
So with specific for COVID, so besides COVID, we as a health department don't regulate anything in a, in a beauty salon, but like any other workplace, we saw a lot of public health orders come out during the pandemic. Um, and a lot of those were from either the, uh, the governor's office or the commissioner's office at the state level with the authority given to local health. In addition, um, and I know Brooklyn used this authority a lot, was, um, was the local authority of the public health commissioner to also institute public health orders. So in that example, you sort of had um, state and locals issuing public health orders, depending on their individual needs of, of each community. And they would say, okay, great. So it adapts to the community. And, and um, that sort of relates to, but the question of, of course, this show is focused on older adults, but uh, is there any special uh, uh, approach to older adults as far as, uh, or is that just part of the community? Well, um, first I say a lot of, um, things like walkable sidewalks that, you know, might have, uh, yes, and I, yeah, I think right. that's a great example of, of um, a, a multitude of public health um, access issues that what walkable sidewalks contribute to in a good way. Um, so if we make walkable sidewalks for people that have access and functional needs, it actually increases the use of sidewalks for everybody. So when we talk about, you know, what makes a community good for a senior population probably makes it a good community for everybody. And I know um, very early on, I found a great partner in, in Ruth Ann and her team at the Senior Center. Um, so I was very excited to make that connection here in Brookline and, and collaborate with them. Um, and one of the things that we're doing now that a uh, current project we're working on is, is a fall prevention project. Um, and that would be in partnership with the health department and the Senior Center. Um, I know we collaborate on many issues, um, housing and how we can support our residents. Um, that are living in unsanitary conditions or might have hoarding conditions. And we work very closely with the senior center on those individual cases and also thinking on a policy-wide and education-wide what we can do in that programming. So many cross um, collaborations between the two departments and we're fortunate to have good partners there. Um, I think the, the sidewalks that I mentioned is actually a great example. And I was recently um, talking to uh, a couple of residents at Center for Communities and um, you know the concerns about um, the sidewalk conditions came up, and I thought it was very interesting that another resident sort of brought up the fact that well, a lot of the issues with the sidewalks are because of the trees and the tree roots. And I thought I said, oh, you know what? That's a great example of some of the difficult decisions that we in municipalities, in particular on public health, need to make. And you know, we said it, we said a second ago how important accessible sidewalks are, and they need to be smooth and safe so people can walk and access them. But we also know how important tree cover is when we're talking about the heat index in the community um, and the risk of, of heat islands. And I think we had a, a heat wave in May this year, which is unheard of, which means three days or more of um, over 90 degrees. So we, we know the value from a public health standpoint of the trees and the value from a public health standpoint of the sidewalks. Right. And so understanding that these things are not always a simple debate, that we have to eventually come to a compromise, but that they both have competing public health priorities. So uh, a lot of that is DPW. How do you work with DPW? Uh, yeah, so DPW. when I, well, we worked a, a lot with DPW and I, I always say I was given an exercise in my former position when they were looking at renovations in town hall. Now, bear with me here, it gets to the point. But they asked um, each department to list out the um, collaborating departments that they work with and, uh, you know, in order. Right. Um, and I literally listed every department. <laughs> I think retirement <laughs> was on the bottom and they said, well, that's just because you're not near retirement age. Right. But, <laughs> but uh, to be honest, public health only works as a collaborative agency. Um, so when I talked at the beginning, our, our role as the chief health strategist is because everything in those social determinants of health um, might be under the guise of other departments, but that they have health implications. So our partnership with them is, is really valuable and really helps us get our message out, but also helps create that community that we all want. Um, so yeah, sidewalks definitely under public works. Um, but when we talk about um, access, community cohesion, walkability, exercise, that they're also all looking at those things too. Um, so we work we work very closely with public works, both on um, you know things like promoting good sidewalks, but also on enforcement too. They have a very strong enforcement arm and solid waste management that we work with them. And I have to say, if we're talking about public works, I have to um, give some kudos to. Uh, uh, Commissioner Galantine, who's been also just like Ruth Ann, so helpful to me um, in my first couple months here uh, working for Brookline and helping me understand how, how processes work here and in, in, um, in the system. So I just really appreciate her collaboration also. 
It, that's really good news. <laughs> we've worked, obviously, we work closely with Ruth Ann, and we've uh, had Erin Galantine uh, on the show a number of times and, and work with her. And uh, the fact that, you know, it's a town, <laughs> but town, Norwood was a town too, correct, is correct. Am I correct? Yes, so yes. No more you're town. used to the fact that they're all different groups working individually and, and each one having to somehow reach out to the others. So to hear you say you're doing it, makes me feel good. <laughs> oh, good, good. And really, there's no oh, other way to do public health. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's hard to do. It's, it's really hard. Uh, as far as some of the things that you do do, um, I, I was, you know, I'm tempted to get into the uh, fall prevention because I really, uh, that's a big thing. And I know that you're heavily involved. So let's make sure we leave time to go over it. But uh, come back to that. Uh, in the meantime, just some of the things that you are come to first. I mean, uh, what are you responsible? Natural disasters, uh, you know, well, I see five. I see when there's a problem in a house, I see uh, a fire department come. I see the police department come. I see uh, uh, an ambulance sometimes come. Uh, and and it's, uh, I don't see public health on an emergency basis. Uh, what's your role? Sure. Well, we have a couple of roles. Um, I, maybe we'll go before the pandemic, because um, we yeah. did do a lot of planning around um, pandemic response. And really, since 9-11, public health departments have been charged with planning for mass dispensing of prophylaxis. So that could be, um, it was structured around uh, the anthrax exposures that happened right after 9-11, and how would we distribute antibiotics to the population, um, you know, in a certain amount of time. So that's sort of where public health started to lean into emergency preparedness and response. Um, in addition to that, we manage the, the Medical Reserve Corps, and that's a group of, um, I think, almost 400 volunteers, which is amazing. Um, and one of the great aspects that sort of attracted me to come to work in Brookline is that um, not only is there a very active and large corps, but it has been able, it has been sustained over time. And many um, health departments and regional groups that have put together medical reserve corps had trouble sort of maintaining it because it's a lot of work and dedication and takes a lot of resources. Um, but that Brookline has been successful at that and continues to use them. We're going to be using them at our, our flu clinics coming up and um, engaging with them on, a, on, on many projects to, to assist the department. So um, there's those aspects of emergency preparedness. Um, but as far as uh, responding to disasters, I think our, our job is a lot on the recovery side. So responding to the disaster after the disaster, and we think about you know the floods and the, the storms, and um, once the waters recede, sort of you're left, what are the conditions and the environmental conditions um, of the built environment that you're left with? In the, um, the mold, housing inspections, it's really, really working with our environmental um, health division uh, to make sure that those uh, buildings are safe to re-enter and things like that. So the only place that it would be different would be as with COVID, where, where it's a... Uh... Uh, yeah, I mean, health direct, directly, directly related to health and something that's clearly in your purview up front and from there on, you know, right. Yeah. And we saw a lot, obviously, our role with contact tracing and um, disease, uh, stopping the spread of the disease. So really, um, I say contact tracing sort of became a, a term that everybody knew after, you know, March of 2020 in, in this country, um, but something that health departments have been doing for a long time, you know, around a pertussis outbreak, obviously, uh, with HIV, you know, that we use right. that as a lot of example of, of how we're doing interviews and now we do it with monkeypox. And um, so when there is a communicable disease, we were doing contact tracing. TB is another one that we routinely do. So you have a TB exposure and we need to understand those circles of exposure and who needs to be tested and possibly get care and make sure that they are not converting to positive cases and then spreading it even more. So right. disease prevention and control, um, is something that we are always working on. And like you kind of said at the beginning, there's always some new disease and some- Right, so COVID, stuff. the fact of COVID, where it is, how it is, it's one of the diseases and one of the key ones, obviously, but it's something that's ongoing and the activities you do, it still do and continue and need, both need the same resources and apply the resources that you have yeah. to, to that. Sure. To, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, rodents. <laughs> Sorry. Well, what about them? <laughs> we, like the, we like to say the word because it brings up so both cringing and, uh, and and all sorts of thoughts. But where are we on the rodent situation? Yeah, well, I feel like I finally have some some good news um, and really want to thank the select board for, for supporting the action plan that Commissioner Gallantin and I uh, put forward to the town administrator 
um, and, and his work to help present it to the select board and help us find the funding for it. So we were able to um, just this week um, present to the select board an action plan with um, short, middle and long term actions that we could take as a town to help combat the, the rodent population. Say so, um, this is not something uh, you know that just Brookline is seeing. This is across many urban areas that they are seeing increases in rodent population. Um, we kind of surmise that it is a result of the pandemic and a lot of our activities. Um, I know Aaron has talked about uh, the use of the parks has changed dramatically with um, you know more food and more waste. People are now working in different areas. How you work from home, more residential trash, and also definitely things like outdoor dining. Um, sort of when we shut down. Um, rodent populations lost their food sources, so sort of expanded their territories into other areas to identify new food sources. And then when we opened back up, those old food sources opened, but not all populations would sort of go back to those original areas. They would stay where they are and find additional food sources. So it's not only the growth in population, but it's the expansion of their areas, um, which we think is really leading to well, activity in places we hadn't seen it before. Right. But and, and, yeah, what's the kind of where, where are we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's less important of why we're here, but more what are we going to do, right? That's what everybody wants to know. Um, and it, I mean, I'm going to be honest, it's, it's been a struggle as I came on board and um, the health department is really in a, a deep hole, um, not, you know, mainly because of the pandemic, but also for staffing issues that we've had. Um, we've right. actually uh, shrunk in size over the last couple of years, um, but grown in responsibility. And that's a result of, of a multitude of things. Um, and then on top of that, adding, uh, adding COVID and the fact that we were just so behind on so many of our regular duties because everybody was just reassigned to pandemic response. Yeah. Um, but with that said, I'd like to focus on the positive, how we're moving forward and trying to address the issue. So I, I sort of quickly talked about, but we have some short-term actions that we can take, and that includes um, bringing on hopefully two um, contracts, um, one which is a um, pest control company that was working in a lot of our neighboring communities. Um, that not only works to um, have these, they, they call them smart traps, but there are some really ingenious systems that um, not only trap the rodents, but also track activity. So they're, they're trapping and killing the rodents, which we want. Um, and they're doing it without uh, rodenticide, without any pesticide use. So it's kind of, so that's also yeah. a bonus. Um, but that they're also tracking each, each kill gets tracked and the activity and how um, active or inactive it is in the area. So which allows us to better deploy the limited resources that we do have. So if we're seeing an area that's getting lots and lots of hits, well, we need to go in there and we need to look at their solid waste management. We need to understand any contributing factors in the area. Is there outdoor dining that is out of compliance? Is there overflowing dumpsters? Um, are there uh, other properties that are treating it or are not treating appropriately? So it helps us sort of identify those hot spots. Um, we know of the hotspots right now, but what, what this will provide us, you know, we know based on complaints, to be honest, sure. but what this will do is provide us data on actual rodent activity, which is what is the real indicator that we need. It's, so that's the one contract. <laughs> and then the second one, um, these are all the short-term action plans. I, yeah, right. Um, the second contract is really, um, our department is struggling with the ongoing enforcement and how time consuming it is to work with um, the food establishments that, that do um, create some sort of harborage condition, some condition that contributes to the population, whether it be, um, you know, insufficient trash pickup or cleaning out um, grease traps that are, you know, grease receptacles in the back of their property. So a lot of times we go out there, um, we ask, you know, whatever establishment to give us their pest control reports, and we make sure that their solid waste receptacles are in good condition and the area is clean. Um, you know, if we cite a violation of any of those things, they correct it and they're now in compliance. What happens is two, three, four weeks later, things fall out of compliance again, we're back at that doing it again. And we of course issue fines and have escalating enforcement, but the problem is it's very, very time consuming, all those steps. And so what we're hoping this contract will do is um, bring in a food safety consultant, a sanitation slash food safety consultant that can really go work with our our food businesses in these hotspot areas to identify contributing factors and help minimize those as much as possible. So really do the handholding with the establishments that to be honest, the staff in my department just don't have time to do. I mean, they're running from one complaint to another, Never mind all the other regulatory enforcement that they have to do, such as housing complaints um, and other routine food inspections. Oh, yeah. I mean, they have a, a, a very large load in the environmental health department of regulatory enforcement that they do. And rodent complaints are just one of many, many inspections that they're out doing all day. 
Right. So I'm hoping those two contracts really give us the data we need um, right. and the actions to really bring down those rodent populations. Yeah, the other, the other things are a little smaller around communications and there's, <laughs> I know there's a lot to do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we launch a website and looking about how we can improve our communication. Once we get that data in, how can we show the activity that we're doing, the evaluation? And then um, how can we also communicate about prevention? Because I can't be in public health and not talk about prevention. So how can we educate um, residents on how they can make their properties less attractive to rodents? And what can and we you do right about a, trash? You're right where I want to be, communications. Yes, it's always <laughs> the key. Um, failure in the communications so, yeah, creates probably most of our problems, just in general, not necessarily in, in government, but general human relations, right? So how, how do you communicate with the community, with the community on, on, of course, rodents, but on anything? I mean, you know, there's, there's uh, environment, there's changes in the, as the weather changes, there's needs uh, in all these cases. How is the latest information get out to the public? And it's hard, you know, we're in this <laughs> we're in business quote, but, uh, and it's very difficult. What are you doing? I think it's, um very difficult on a multitude of levels. I think the amount of information out there and the amount of misinformation out there creates a more challenge for us. And I think we saw that definitely during the pandemic. There was a lot of misinformation. So not only are you trying to get out your correct information, you're trying to get out your information, you're also trying to correct the misinformation. So it's almost twice the work. And I think the, the varying degrees in systems that exist, right? The, the different tools we have to get information out. We have a social media, we have several types of social media, we have the news blog on the website. We unfortunately, as right as I got here, lost the tab, right, which was a excellent way to get not everybody's on computers. And having a local paper is sort of foundation for, for any government. And a lot of people, uh, especially older adults who are they're men, not especially, but many who depend on paper. And uh, it's not there. I mean, it's, uh, it's just not there. Yeah. Um, so we lean into those collaborations that we talked about working with the senior center. Yes. Um, they are working to get that helps. letters out. Um, yeah. Working with the Center for Communities again with that conversation I had, because um, this, this question comes up a lot. How do we get information out there? We, we could be doing the best programs, but if people don't know about it, it's, it's not really effective. Um, so it, it's I'm definitely working. a challenge. I, uh, I always say when people ask me this question, um, I throw it right back out and say, well, how do you get your information? And what do you think are the best ways we can get information to you? Maybe working with big and doing TV shows might be a good solution. Uh, I'm doing the two social media things for uh, one for Brookline Can and one for myself, where uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter uh, and putting things out. I see something come from you, it goes. <laughs> as oh, fast. I appreciate that. Almost immediately. I mean, it's like there are certain sources in which you just got to move it out and move it on to the people that uh, that are looking for it. Uh, you know, but still, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. And especially the misinformation also it's, uh, makes it very difficult. All you can do is get the get you know from the correct source, which is you. Uh, get from the correct source. Get that information out there as quick and as often. Because one time is not enough. People have to you know, just don't see it until they see it again and again. And they have to see it when they're ready to see it. When, um, you know, when we when we send out messages that say about, you know, access to mental health resources, well, that's not something you would really acknowledge until maybe you or a family member needed it. Um, so understanding that, like you said, you need to put things out repeatedly for people to receive them when they need it. Um, now, how are you getting information out about the full prevention program? Well, that's just at the beginning. So let, I do want to talk about it, but we don't have much to say yet. But um, we're just at the start of collaborating with the senior center. We're going to, the first step is going to be doing some survey data. Okay. So um, I know we do a lot of surveys, but they're really important um, because for me coming in, I want to make sure that we're constantly doing data gathering and evaluation. And I think it's, it's particularly important um, in this environment where there is a lot of mistrust of the government that we are proving that right. the resources we're spending and the actions we're taking are having a positive impact on the community and that we're reaching our goals. So making sure we have baseline data and then show an improvement over time. With public health, that improvement usually takes a lot of time. So it's sort of hard to prove immediate um, results because we're gonna, we wanna see a reduction in hospitalization visits and things like that. So that, that'll take time to impact with a fall prevention program. Um, you know, the classic example of that is um, we have some really good metrics around use substance use, not to change it, but it's just an example that we have that is right. that is very, we have very good indicators, but the prevention strategies that we're putting in now with our youth 
are going to have um, long term results where we're going to have five, 10 years before we start to see reductions in, um, in use, use rates. Um, you know, I think we have a long view with tobacco. So we've seen um, how those prevention efforts have led to really a reduction in, in um, tobacco use and really the way youth even perceive tobacco as, as a, you know, it's gross and nobody smokes. Vaping is a separate issue, but. Um, yeah, but I was, you, had that, you read my mind. <laughs> yeah, vaping, we are, you know, is new, right? So we have to right. sort of, we're constantly keeping up with industry and, and implementing the same strategies, really, whether right. we're talking about alcohol, um, tobacco, vaping, uh, marijuana, it's all the same prevention strategies, but we need that long-term um, time that we've had with tobacco um, to really have an impact. So it, it makes challenging. It makes it challenging for public health because you know I can't say well if I go out and, and plow the streets whether well, they have no much snow on them. So you see the results right away. Our results are going to be in five to ten years from now when we you know lower disease burden or lower you know substance use rates or increase you know better mental health and wellness in the communities. Those are going to be more long term results. Yeah, well, the awareness, though, and the information and the planning is uh, is key, I would think, or certainly a big impact uh, of what that information is. Uh, uh, it goes both ways, right? Collecting information is probably uh, as important to you or more important than, uh, than just putting it out only. Uh, yeah, and back to sort of how do we get information out? Well, I want to hear where people, I want to be where they're at. So where do they get their information and how do I get what I want out there where they're looking? So it is right. definitely a two-way street. Yeah, and everybody gets it from different sources. <laughs> Which makes our job challenging, but we're up for the challenge. No, no, this way, yeah, you can do it. <laughs> the, uh, okay, so the new, the new activities, the, uh, um, you, you were saying that you were talking about, uh, what do they call it, the center? What, I forgot what it was called, but you, you had mentioned it earlier. Uh, there was a dashboard? associated with something and uh yeah well, yeah if i have a moment i'd ahead. love to share and sort of go over quickly our our, our data dashboard yeah we got time. screen here um so this is a one second there we go um this is something that we've been able to bring online um oops, it's just reloading um this is our first page i will apologize we can't get the maps to quite work they work when we load it up to the website the maps don't quite work but um let me show you if I zoom out. We have all been there. Yeah, we, we, we keep working with IT and the, um, the software company that we use. Um, so this shows similar to the CDC, the community levels. Um, and then down here is where I wish it would just focus on Brookline, but we uh, broke it down by zip code here. And you can see the case counts by zip code. But I don't want to harbor because I think the really good data is actually on the, on the other pages. So we have our overview with the maps. And then we have our case counts. Um, so what, what I started saying was that this was um, we're very fortunate, you know, fortunate or unfortunate. As a result of the pandemic, um, there has been some additional funding coming to support local public health infrastructure. And part of that um, are some state grants, federal money coming through the state and some actually state allocated funding for the first time coming to local public health. And we were able to bring on an epidemiologist, which allows us to do some really interesting stuff um, looking at data. And right now we're focused on COVID because um, we have a lot of good data on it. And um, uh, understandably here, grant was a COVID grant. So we need to, um, this is really just a start though that we hope to, like I talked about using data and evaluation for really all of our programs. But here you can see, this is the Omicron wave. This is the wave we had last year. And then yep. um, these are our current numbers. We know this is all based on PCR testing. So environment and conditions are constantly changing. We know PCR testing is no longer a real good indicator of the cases because so many people are using the at-home test kits, which is wonderful. The more access we have to testing, the better. So that's a good thing, um, but yeah, it just makes the indicator yeah. not as valuable for us. So really when we look at case counts, we usually go to um, the, the MWRI wastewater data. But um, what is really valuable right now for us, especially with the new booster is looking at our vaccination rates. And oh, I just wow. want to go down here and point out, I mean, I don't think you can get a higher vaccination rate than 90%. Um, you know, once you're up at 90, that's, you're considered everybody. And, you know, it's not quite a hundred. So hundred would be where the red line is in each of these age groups. And then oh, you can wow. see the percentage of that age group that has, this is in the blue lines are the people that have received the primary series. So um, very great vaccination rates, particularly in our older high-risk populations. So right. I'm very proud of that. 
um, yep. we have some work to do, particularly in our uh, 20 to 29 year olds, right. um, you know, and a little bit in our in our younger ages too. Um, right now, it's hard for us to parse out the boosters because there have been so many boosters and it really depends on your age and your health conditions and, you know, your risk category. So right now the term is up to date, just means that you're up to date with the latest recommendations, but the data doesn't reflect that too well for us. Um, but it just tells us how many people have gotten boosters. They might be multiple boosters, but so it doesn't. So I is this data available? Asterisks with this data. Is this data also available to, it's available to anybody in the Brookline government. Is this can public actually look at this? Or is this? Uh... Yeah, I'm right on the uh, the Brooklyn the website. town website, just under the yeah. health department. And maybe That's I should right. right up here. If you go to the health department, we yeah. have a the COVID hub right here. And yeah. I'm sorry, maybe I should have started there. How to find it? No, I think everybody knew that. I, I was just making sure. <laughs> and then we try to make it as easy as possible. We're actually one of the initiatives we're working on right now is trying to make the website as user friendly as possible. So if right. anybody has any input on that, because what might make sense for us where to put things might not be how the public's thinking about it. Sure. But I just wanted to point out again, overall great vaccination rate in town, but we do have some work to do um, around boosters, again, particularly in, um, in, the, in the younger ages, but pretty successful in our um, high risk populations with the boosters, which is great. I would say most of our case counts are in these other younger age groups. And we know what we've all learned with COVID is that it's really a community-wide effort that we need to have. Um, because if the, the disease and the virus keeps spreading in our younger populations, it's, it means our at-risk individuals are still at risk. Right. The more people get vaccinated across all age groups, the better that is for everybody. Absolutely. Um, but I don't want to take up too much time, but if people are really into data and graphs, which I love, you can, you can sort of change the dates on things and it will adjust the graphs um, to reflect those dates. Um, so really so some fun things you can do here. Yeah, we, we've ex we're extending a little beyond the time, but I'm, that, this is important. And, and so is the uh, um, anything else that you want to bring up. I don't want to cut you short at all. So uh, is there anything uh, else uh, that your activities that you would like to get out there at this point to uh, at least the older adults? Uh, please. Yeah, well, definitely for older adults. Um, keep an eye out for our the fall risk um, survey that we will be doing soon and then the program that comes after. Um, and then the other big initiative also related around data, but um, really what I feel like is what's going to um, determine where we're moving in the next five to 10 years as far as public health in Brookline, which is our community health assessment. So it was oh, very yes. fortunate to get awarded um, ARPA funds to run a community health assessment and a community health improvement plan. And um, for me coming in and being new um, and so many competing priorities um, in the community, um, all great ideas, great initiatives, but understanding okay, well, which ones do we pick first to work on? And what I'm really hoping is that our community assessment will identify those, um, those areas that where we have the most need and the most gaps. Um, and also where are we most successful? Because we should celebrate those successes too. Um, so is there feedback? The survey you're saying is coming. Uh, how, how much will that information, how soon will that get out as it's collected and be available? Yep. Right. So that will be um, probably a year, year and a half long process. Um, okay. to get those and that we're just hitting uh, the ground with our request for proposals as part of the procurement process. Um, but excited to be able to start that work. Yep, that's excellent. Okay, uh, my, I would go on and on, but we have to stop at some point. So thank you, Sagal. Anytime you want to come back, anytime you want to do something, it's uh, we're open to you. Uh, as long as you want to communicate, we're, ready, we're here to help. So uh, thank you. Well, thank and you. I, I appreciate tell, that. Yeah, I want to tell everybody that uh, remind them that the show will be aired next week, uh, probably on the, it's usually Wednesday night. Uh, we usually find that out a day or so after it's so you'll know already because you're watching me, and and then it's often shows up in the few weeks following at various times, and it's on. Uh, you can find it on the website for Brookline Can, and on the uh, it'll be distributed through uh, the Twitter and Facebook accounts of Brookline Can. So thank you, everybody, and thank you, Seagal. Everybody take care and be safe.